I'm going to read the first chapter of Genesis and then expand upon it, but if you'd like to read with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was empty and a formless math cloaked in darkness, and the Spirit of God was hovering over its surface. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that it was good. Then he separated the light from the dark. And God called the light day and the darkness night. Together, these made up one day. And God said, Let there be a space between the waters to separate waters from water. And so it was so. As God made this space to separate the waters from above and below, God called the space sky, and this happened the second day. And God said, Let the waters beneath the sky be gathered into one place, so dry ground appeared, and so it was. And God named the dry ground land and the water the sea. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land burst forth with every sort of grass and seed bearing plant, and let there be trees that grow seed bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And so it was. The land was filled with seed bearing plants and trees. Their seeds produced plants and trees of like kind and one kind. And God saw that it was good. This all happened on the third day. Then God said, let the bright lights appear in the sky to separate day from night it will be signs marked for seasons, the days and the years. But the light shined down upon the earth, and so it was. For God made two great lights, the sun and the moon, to shine down upon the earth. The great one, the sun, presides during the day. The lesser one, the moon, presides through the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in heaven to light the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. This all happened on the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every sort of fish and every kind of bird. And God saw that was good. Then God blessed them saying, let the fish multiply and fill the oceans. Let the birds increase and fill the earth. This has all happened on the fifth day. Then God said, let us spring forth every kind of animal, livestock, small animal, and wildlife. <clears throat> and so it was. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, and small animals, each able to reproduce more of its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make people in our image to be like ourselves. They will be masters over, lo over life, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the livestock, wild animals, and small things. So God created people in his own image. God patterned them after himself, male and female he created them. God blessed them and told them, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Be masters over the fish and the birds and all the animals. And God said, look, I have given you the seed-bearing plants throughout the earth and all the fruit-bearing trees for your good. And I have given all the grasses and all other green plants to the animals and birds for their food. And so it was. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was excellent in every way. This happened on the sixth day. So the late Morris Kachansky, a wilderness survival expert in the uh, universe, from the University of Alberta, wrote this in one of his survival books. The more you know, the less you will carry. The less you know the more you will carry. Until the age of 10, he lived in the wilderness without electricity with his family. And he grew up to focus on teaching others how to survive in the wilderness amongst inhospitable conditions and survive, to thrive. His philosophy was the more that you knew, the less you had to rely on carrying survival equipment, which could cause a burden or could cause strife if you didn't know how to use it. Over the last six months, our, our country has experienced significant upheaval, um, affecting most of all, all of our aspects of our lives. Uh, the relative little, little the experts understand about COVID-19 has driven much speculation and fear in our society. But the concerns that have affected our day-to-day -day lives has been evident. 
the safety tactics evoked in response has affected many, e many economically uh, and caused significant and emotional distress among many. Additionally, social upheavals and generational pain has affected our social structures and our relationships. A highly anticipated presidential election throws a bit more fuel on top of the flames and uncertainty and fear ensues. Political parties are working more and more against each other than with each other and spewing rhetoric that does nothing but divide. Our country is currently carrying heavy burdens because of the unknowns. Kachansky seems to be correct in his philosophy here. Our country knows very little of what's ahead and very little in general. Most suggestions that we see or we hear seem to be almost on theory and hypothesis rather than truth and confidence and conviction. We carry a heavy burden because we don't know. While there is much we do know about the future, while there is much we do not know about the future of this world, there is much we do know about this. We worship a God of creation, the holy God, the great I am. We know that to be true. And we will look in Genesis to deepen that knowledge and understanding. The late G.I. Packard wrote in his book, Knowing God, once you become aware that the main business you are here for is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place of their own accord. Today, we will become more aware of the business of God. If you look in your Bibles in Genesis 1, the first seven Hebrew words in Scripture are the foundation for everything to follow. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Scripture makes us aware right away that the God we worship is the one true God existing from eternity past, existing currently, and will exist in the future. In the beginning, before any element of life was known. God, as a holy and distinct entity, existed. God perfectly brought forth each part of creation, knitting them together, and creating humankind with an image and a purpose. God is incomparable to any other idol or deity that our current world worships, or has worshipped. So for reference, polytheism believes that there are many gods. Pantheism believes that everything in the universe is part of or one with God, and God is not personal. Panentheism believes that the entire universe is one with God, but God is both universe and beyond. Henotheism holds that there is one God with many minor gods. And deism believes in a single creator, but commonly rejects the concept of personal God what God's doing to interfere with creation. So why is this important? Because to know our God and how our God is different allows us to walk around in this world and carry less of a burden to weight. With confidence, we can know our relationship with God. We can know the world around us. We can carry something that is light and powerful, and that's hope. When we look at verses 2 through 25, Scripture shows the phases of creation. We can specifically see the order and intention that created was knit together with, each element being built upon the next. When we know God's nature, God's power, God's presence, God's justice, God's forgiveness and grace, we know that because it's rooted in what we see here in the creation story. Revelation 4.11 says this, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. In the book of Job, chapter 26, verses 13, we see reflection on this as well. Scripture says this, By God's breath in heavens, by God's breath the heavens are made beautiful. Creation was not brought into existence by an accident or randomly occurring events. God did not just create for the short term or the grat his gratification, but gave creation a system, seasons, phases, and gave us the opportunity to dwell over it. 
I don't know about you, but this intentionality and, and perfection passes kind of my feeble understanding. I like systems. I like to know things, but I, I can't understand fully how God did this. And nor should I, because I have a, a mind of a man. As we look to verses 26 through 27, we will see God's creation of humankind in a unique way compared to that creation prior. Just as God spoke the other elements in the creation, God spoke and humanity is created. There's one major difference, however, in this. And if you look at the text, we'll, we'll see that. All of creation, prior to the word of God, Scripture uses a third person reference. The phrase used is, let there be. In the creation of humanity, the personal is used in first person tense. The language is, let us make. The personal language indicates a different kind of care, intention, and even purpose. Additionally, God made humanity different. As we look at a reference, verse 11 shows God creating other living creatures based on, quote, their various kinds, or as verse 12 indicates, in quote, according to their kinds. We see this again in verse 25. Humanity, however, in verse 26 is created in God's own image. Through this image, humanity was created in distinct ways, male and female, and given domain over other living creatures. Humanity was crafted and molded uniquely. So this is the starting point that we see humanity's creation and function with a special purpose. In verse 28, God gives a blessing to both man and woman. Humanity has a role to play in this world, and it starts here. When we talk about the gospel in the next couple of weeks, it starts here in knowing who God is. Sometimes we look over the creation story because it's simple, right? We read it and we know, okay, great, we move on. To take a look at this more is important. Many pastors and Bible studies and groups, they use tactics to help illuminate passages, right? They, they study and they look at certain messages in ways that, quote unquote, they speak to them, right? They may look around the corner to see what's next, or they make attempts to look at a passage to find different meanings or takeaways than what they've heard before. We've come to a time where simplicity, unfortunately, makes things seem import, unimportant. This part of scripture, I think, is affected by that. This part of scripture is important to the foundation of everything that we talk about in the next four weeks, everything that's next. For the rest of scripture rests upon this understanding of who God is and who we are. This foundation holds everything else in place. Now, I don't want to take a reductionistic approach and, and kind of just say, oh, this is the most important thing ever. I don't want to say that. I want to set the stage for the future, for the next, for what's coming. Part of my goal is to talk about this and get out of the way for the next three weeks of discussing of how we interact today and what the takeaways and, and how we deal with this world. In a world of chaos, sometimes we forget our creator. We get distracted by the world and where, what's going on in it. We forget the intentionality that we were made in and the unique processes that God brought creation in. There's no better set of passages and verses than what we've just kind of read and gone through. Genesis chapter 1 is intentional. It sets the stage, and we can move on with confidence and clarity. As we leave today, we look back into the lives that we've lived. We understand where we've come from in the last several months. And we try to figure out how to move forward differently, better, while our physical lives are fairly safe compared to some, our emotional and our intellectual lives have been taking a massive beating over the last several months. Every day, news, social media, health updates, school updates, governmental rules, uh, they're always changing. They're, 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 they're in flux. The battleground today that we face is not just in the physical, but the intellectual and the emotional. 
one of the things I pray for is that your emotional minds and your intellectual minds are protected during this week so that you're not distracted, so that you can remember who your creator is comparatively to who the world says a God is, or what our purpose is comparatively to what our world says a purpose is. Never rest in our current levels of understanding and connection to the one true God. Let's remember this week what Packer writes in his book, Desiring God, in the later chapters. Knowing about God is crucially important for the living of our lives. So in response to that, let's study God's word every day this week. Let's meditate on it. Let the Spirit illuminate it for us. Let's look back upon this creation story to see the perfection that God put in place so that we know the business that we were created for. And this will be expanded upon in the next couple weeks as we talk about our current state and what God's doing and what we should be doing in response. To know the business of God that we are created for allows us to attune ourselves to the emotional and psychological connectedness that we need to have with our God. The more we know, the less we will carry. The less we have to carry, the lighter our spirit can be, the better we can be every day as a child, as a spouse, as a parent, as a friend, as a worker. Everything you do, you can carry less weight during the day because of what you know and who you're connected to. We are to live holy. Why? Because the one that created us is fully holy. God, Yahweh, this, this kitten here, is created, right? <laughs> now, I don't think that the kitten should be living as a holy life because it was created differently, but I should be, right? Because I'm created differently. And also, as we will see in the next coming months or weeks, we are going to see a change in our culture, but we will not see a change in our God. And with that, we need to rest this week. Let's pray. God, thank you for everything that you've given us in this creation. Thank you for this home, this space. Thank you for these people here. Thank you that we are safe from the physical dangers of, of life. Also, thank you that we are safe from the psychological and the mental things that are going on all around us. We thank you for this sanctuary here. Lord, we ask that as we leave this place, as we leave today, as we enter into the week, and we are exposed to this world, that you would continue to protect us, and that we would commit ourselves to disciplines that allow us to be confident and connected to you. God, we thank you for everything you've done. In the past, we thank you for everything you're doing currently. We also thank you for things you will be doing in the future. Where we humble ourselves before you, and we just ask that you continue to, through your spirit, remind us that you love, love us. Amen.